Welcome to this video on renewable energy resources. I'm Aida Awad from Broward College. Our learning targets for today will be to describe the differences between renewable and non-renewable sources of energy and recognize examples in today's video of renewable energy resources, describe environmental consequences caused by exploiting different forms of energy, and discussing how transitioning to renewable forms of energy will help reduce the threat of global warming. First of all, we're going to start out talking about a cost comparison for generating electricity. And it's important to keep in mind the factors that impact the choice of fuel for electrical generating plants. Those include the cost of fuel, capital costs of building the plant and maintaining the plant, the operations of the plant, and financing. And all of these costs vary somewhat by location. We'll start with this chart in the middle here that shows us the energy source in the left-hand column from hydro to biomass, geothermal, wind, solar thermal, photovoltaics, natural gas, coal, and nuclear power. And the generating costs, which range from two cents per kilowatt hour for hydropower through to about 13 cents on the high end of the range for solar thermal. It's interesting to note that things like biomass, natural gas, wind, coal, and nuclear power all range within a very small area, about six to eight cents per kilowatt hour for generation. Moving now to the bottom diagram, we have a lot of data in this diagram here from the EIA. And what it shows us is both the capacity of installed uh, new megawatts in 2013 and the average construction cost for those generators that were installed in 2013. So the blue bars on the chart show us the capacity that was installed and the black diamonds show us the cost. It's no wonder that natural gas had the largest amount of capacity installed in 2013 because it was by far the lowest average construction cost, followed by solar PV, wind, biomass, hydro, and finally geothermal and petroleum liquids. We have two more charts on the right-hand side here showing us the projected capacity additions in gigawatts for the different types of power generation. The top one showing us by the year 2020 and the bottom one showing us by the year 2040. And it's interesting to note here that advanced combined cycle, that's combining uh, both a gas, natural gas, and a steam turbine, uh, leads the way by 2040. You can also expect large increases in wind both by 2020 and by 2040. And by 2020, some increase in advanced nuclear power. And those two sets of data come from the EIA. Moving on to talk about solar energy for the next several slides. Here we're looking at direct solar. So solar energy is collecting and transforming uh, the sun's energy into other useful forms. And that includes active solar heating that absorbs solar energy as heat and pumps and fans that distributed heat out to heat up water, such as swimming pools or just general household hot water. That can provide a family with hot water year round. This could be a good savings when you consider that over 8% of the energy consumed in the US is used to heat water. At the top of this slide, you can see a standard household solar generation plant where you have solar panels on the roof those are heating up the liquid, going into a heat exchanger, and filling up that hot water tank. An alternative type of solar is passive solar energy. So this is a system that does not require mechanical devices to distribute that collected heat. By building those designed features into a home or a building, you can warm the buildings in winter and cool them in summer. It takes advantage of south-facing windows to receive more sunlight. It takes advantage of heating up floors and walls and then that heat is transmitted via convection. In order to take advantage of solar passive energy, you must have a well-insulated building, and solar passive can save as much as 80% of heating costs, and about 7% of the new homes built in the U.S. take advantage of passive solar heating. Photovoltaic cells have been around for quite some time. We're going to start off with these two diagrams on the bottom right corner here that come from NREL. And this shows the increase in efficiency and the decrease in cost over time. So from the year 1995 through to projected out to 2020, we see for all three types of PV that the system efficiency has increased rather dramatically. And the costs for those since 1995 have also decreased rather dramatically, making solar PV a good choice. In the bottom left-hand diagram, 
we can see the U.S. estimated distributed and utility scale solar capacity and generation capacity. So this diagram comes from the EIA and it shows different sectors. So the residential, commercial, and industrial sectors shown here. And you can see that both the capacity and the monthly generation between January 2014 and 2016 have increased, but increased rather slowly. And in the top right corner, you see something new that's coming online, which is an integrated solar power roofing system. Looks pretty nice and it's efficient. Another relatively new technology in the solar field is solar thermal electric generation. This takes advantage of concentrating solar energy via mirrors or lenses onto fluid filled pipes. And then the computer guided system tracks the sun for optimum efficiency. That sunlight heats up oil in those pipes that's used to produce steam, which of course turns turbines and generates electricity. It's more efficient than other solar technologies and it's becoming cost effective when compared with fossil fuels. And again, solar power, so no pollution, acid deposition, or climate change impacts. One concern with this power generation source is that on cloudy days or at nighttime, there is an alternate source of energy required. Let's turn our attention now to solar generated hydrogen in terms of fuel cells has the potential to provide electricity for transportation and electricity. Solar electricity must be used immediately. However, hydrogen can be stored or transported by a pipeline. Fuel cells produce energy as long as they are supplied with fuel, and that fuel is hydrogen and oxygen. The cost of fuel cells has dropped, but they're still rather expensive. And powering transportation with fuel cells will require setting up special stations. You can see a picture of a hydrogen station shown here and a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle at the top. Turning now to some indirect solar energy sources. These are the combustion of biogas. So taking advantage of that stored solar energy that plants have in them, wind energy, and hydropower. For my students here in South Florida, you'll notice the two diagrams, the bottom one showing an assessment of locations where wind power would be a good option and the top one showing all of the different kinds of power plants currently operating around the state of Florida. We'll start with biogas. Biogas is using plant and animal material as fuel. This includes both plant materials and animal wastes. It's renewable if it's used properly. About 50% of the world's population actually relies on biomass fuel. We know that that's not always a good option because it does release things such as black carbon in some cases. However, the new biogas digesters produce gas by microbial decomposition, and they produce methanol, ethanol, which can replace gasoline in internal combustion engines, and biodiesel that's made from plant and animal oils. You can see sources of biodiesel fuels in the diagram here on the right. Some of the benefits of biomass include reducing dependence on fossil fuels, and producing lower levels of sulfur and ash than coal when burned. Some of the concerns about biomass is that producing that biomass to burn can use land and water that was typically used for food production. And the conversion of corn, sugarcane, and wood crops to ethanol can result in higher food prices and reduced food supplies. Also, if they're cleaning fields, conservation tillage will not take place. Thinking about harnessing the power of wind. Wind turbines are becoming more efficient. They went from about 40 cents per kilowatt hour in 1980 to about four to seven cents per kilowatt hour now. They're most profitable in areas that have consistent wind. And wind power is captured and then distributed through electric grids, just as other electricity is distributed through the grid. It does require the development of new storage and distribution technologies. However, it's a no waste clean energy and every kilowatt hour of wind electricity saves the release of about 2.2 pounds of carbon dioxide that would otherwise be generated by burning fossil fuels. In the top diagram, you can see the distribution pattern for wind energy. So these windmills are capturing the power, turning that turbine, moving the generator, creating the electricity, which is then pushed out to the grid and onto you. And in the bottom right corner, we see a diagram that shows the projected non-hydropower renewable electricity generation projected out through 2035 in billion kilowatts per year. And you'll notice here that both biomass, which we just talked about, and wind dominate this topic. Wind power sounds great. There are some concerns, 
We'll talk about those now. They include bird and bat kills if the turbines are located in bird migration pathways. Those can be corrected by carefully choosing sites, painting blades, having anti-perching devices, and shutting them down during peak migration periods. Developers are also voluntarily conducting studies of wildlife patterns. And then there's always NIMBY, not in my backyard. While some residents welcome the extra money from wind leases, others complain that the wind turbines ruin their view. Turning now to harnessing the power of flowing water. There's a lot of potential energy in that water that's held back by a dam or from tides that can be used to generate electricity. Hydropower is highly efficient, with about 90% of the potential energy being converted to electricity. About 19% of the world's electricity is already generated in this way. Concerns with hydropower include changing the flow of rivers, which oftentimes displaces animals and people, and changing patterns of sedimentation. On the bottom picture here, you can see the Three Gorges Dam, which was recently built in China. And on the top, you can see a diagram showing how a hydropower plant works. And finally, turning to harnessing the Earth's heat, geothermal energy. So heat from Earth's crust is used for heating or electricity. About 1% of the heat in Earth's crust is about 500 times the energy that's contained in all of the oil and natural gas. It's inexpensive and it's reliable where available. The U.S. is the largest producer of geothermal electricity with a major plant in Southern California. The island of Iceland heats two-thirds of its homes directly with geothermal energy. You can see a picture of their geothermal station in the top right picture. And geothermal energy is renewable on a human time scale. Some geothermal systems recirculate the water back to the underground reservoir, and it's considered environmentally benign. I think we can check on our learning targets. We described the differences between renewable and non-renewable sources of energy. We looked at examples of renewable energies. We described environmental consequences caused by exploiting those different types of energy. And we talked about transitioning to renewable forms of energy and how they will reduce the climate change threat. Go ahead and take your mastery check quiz and I'll see you in class.